Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this very special event, Diversifying the Arts, Expanding Representation in Theatre. I'm Her Majesty's Consul General in New York, Anthony Philipson, and I'm delighted that you could join us today. And my very special thanks to Ananda Serum here at the Consulate for bringing this event together. The arts have been vital in getting us through these trying times, and it's important that we take the time to reflect on the significance of storytelling in our communities. Celebrating diversity of thought and experience is how we can learn about one another and can unite us amongst our differences. Unfortunately, not everyone's story gets the chance of being told. In our discussion today, we will cover not only the barriers people of colour face in the theatre industry when trying to be successful, we will also discuss what actions can be taken to create a more equitable future. Diversity and inclusion are core topics for us here at the British Consulate. We're constantly working towards a more equitable workplace ourselves, changing and challenging policy and perception, and making sure we can say we look like the modern UK that we strive to represent. We're also very mindful of the societies and communities within which we operate. It's a privilege to be joined by a really special panel today. We have T. Oliver Reed, co-founder and artistic director of the Black Theatre Coalition, Michelle Terry, artistic director of Shakespeare's Globe in London, and Camilla Forbes, executive producer at the Apollo Theatre here in New York and director of Between the World and Me, currently streaming on HBO Max. I'd like now, though, to hand over to our moderator for today, Lee Bynum, who is currently the Vice President of Impact at Minnesota Opera and has a background in historical research in race and ethnicity in the arts. I'm hugely grateful to them all for giving us their time today for this very special discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoy the event. Thank you again for joining us. Lee, over to you. Thank you. Many people describe a broken system relative to systemic racism, but I maintain that the system is working exactly as designed, hence the intentional exclusion I mentioned just a minute ago. The structures that impede the success of creatives of color are not there by accident. To start this conversation, I'd like to ask the whole group, when looking at power structures in the theater industry, what are the issues behind who holds the power and why? This is such a great question, Lee, um, and, uh, and a big one and a vast one. Um, I'd love that you frame the question of power as being not only systemic, but also crafted and carefully crafted. Um, so I think it's important that we as arts and culture leaders also work diligently of, in the same way that structures were crafted to uphold racism and racist ideals and institutional racism, how do we construct anti-racism um, within our institution and be just as intentional? Um, part of that, I, I do believe, does not just exist, not only on our stages, but through our staff, lead staff, artistic staff, development and managerial staff, boards, and contestants constituency. Um, and also thinking about also, you know, what are we purposed here for? Um, every institution, you know, as you go through your strategic planning, once you have those stakeholders at the table, are we going to be bold enough to really challenge our own core mission and values. And I'm speaking here um, primarily with predominantly uh, predominant culture, predominant white institutions here. Um, because what, when I think about power structure, that's, that's in particularly the way in which the question was posed, that's sort of where I lean in. But also, when I also think about power, power structure, I think about the redistribution of wealth. Um, currently, right now, um, you know, Black theater institutions shape our national narrative and public discourse. Yet, of the $4 billion in philanthropic support here in the U.S., from foundations to arts organizations, 58% goes to the 2% largest organizations, which are all white-led. The other 90% or 8% of the organizations split the last 42% in arts organizations serving community color only end up being 4% of that pie. So what we're seeing here is that the largest number of foundation support are going to the largest organizations, which are not organizations of color, which ultimately leave our institutions consistently underfunded and cons Thanks. 
community and audience interact one together um, and to create an equitable ecosystem um, of a theater community we have to create an equitable ecosystem of funding amongst all of our theater organizations um, and and think about how we're redistributing wealth in a very radical and bold way in order to move forward Thank you for that, Camila. Um, Michelle, I'm curious if you have a perspective on this vis-a-vis -vis your work in the UK. Yeah, the work in the UK, but also as one of those white, supposedly iconic, iconic organizations that is going through not just uh, looking at systemic racism, but looking at a white, a white uh, writer, you know, someone that in, the, in, in within the, the industry is sit in this sort of pejorative position of being white male pale stale how do we decolonize Shakespeare how do we decolonize our spaces um, exactly as Camilla says how do we um, create pipeline development for leaders so that you know when someone like me this post and I you know after my tenure ends making sure that opportunities are available for people to actually apply for the positions that they want to apply for the positions it's not just a case of open the doors and hope people come. Why are people not coming into our organization? Um, I also just wanted to pick up on something Camilla said about, about unconscious bias. I think we're sort of, there is a, a period of awareness happening and it's happening, it's been happening for a long time. It's certainly picked up speed since this summer for all the reasons that we know about. But what's really hard is to maintain that consciousness because that requires everyone to put in the learning and the time and to stay conscious as you try and dismantle an unconscious system that thrives on people being unconscious about how it works because it's familiar. So you just go along with it because it's familiar. How There is a period of time of raising consciousness with everybody. And that, with that at the moment that still sits in our leadership positions. How are we still working towards consciousness, using data to not worry about personal opinion? These are the facts. How are we taking data to actually change um, and an irrefutable, it's irrefutable, but we can't argue with it exactly as Camilla said about what's happening in the States. We know that statistically 90% of our arts council organizations uh, are white led in the UK, where that funding is being distributed, there's huge uh, research into where that money has gone during COVID. Um, so yeah, you, the, the narrative doesn't have to be a story, doesn't have to be fiction. We've got lots of facts to back up. There's an uh, inadequate distribution of leadership, inadequate distribution of power and an inadequate distribution of money. Mm -hmm. I, I love this idea about the data. As an academic, I think that's a really, really important way that we craft arguments. Um, but it leads me to a specific thought, for there to be actual equity and power and to avoid the inclusion illusion, what steps need to be taken and by whom to reshape how the ecosystem itself works? And given your work in both film, um, I'm sorry, in both television and theater, Camila, I'd like to pose first this to you. What are some current examples of success in addressing this? And are there lessons from television and film for theater relative to getting this more correct than it has? Hmm. I don't know if television has all the answers. <laughs> maybe just a few. I mean, I think I can share maybe anecdotally and, it, and this isn't nothing new, I think, for most of us here, um, you know, at the table. Um, most recently, a, a television project I directed, we were very intentional regards to who our productions, who our producers were. This was a work um, about race in America um, with uh, illuminating ta Coates's piece for the screen. We were intentional about every single hire. This was my first time directing for television. So I was clear on the opportunity that it had for me. Um, and I wanted to make sure that number one, our production crew um, reflected the work and the values under which the piece presented. So, you know, when I looked on my production screen on Zoom, you know, it was primarily people of color. Um, we at where there were points when I was on set where, um, you know, it was primarily, you know, women production crew and set, which is unheard of, you know, as many sets that I've that I've worked on as a producer, you, you just don't see that. But it was intentional about being very intentional about every single hire um, from the top down. Um, and you start to see now the face of those building the work change um, 
by just making very simple changes, right? Um, and also making very simple but clear mandates that we all hold dear and, 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 and values that we all are very um, bold and articulate about. So I think what's what's very interesting about what you're talking about has to do with how we are really thinking about who is in the, the pool from which we are, are drawing our talent, right? So I'd like to shift gears a little bit and start talking about the actual talent pipeline. When we talk about expanding representation, we're not just talking about who is on stage, but also who is working behind the scenes and how close these folks are to a given locus of power. There's a very clear connection between BIPOC people in the audience and how diverse the writers, stagehands, producers, ushers, et cetera, and everyone else are involved in this inclusive and representational storytelling. As an educator T, I'd like to pose to you first, what is being done to allow students to engage and learn about the business pieces of what I think of as the performing arts industrial complex? And what do we need to do to make this more accessible to a broader range of individuals? I, th I think a large part of what we have to do is, is look at when we are we are approaching young people with interest in the theater. Uh, mm. many, many times it's not until they're in high school or college that we're like, oh, it's, it's time for you to decide, do you wanna to go to a four year school and be an acting major? Or do you wanna be a director? Or do you, want to be, do you want to be a designer of some sort? What we have to do is start looking at, at young people when they're in that period between nine and 12 years old when they first get that spark of interest. And then we have to hold their hands and support their guardians or parents as well as they go on this journey. Because without the guardians and parents involved, they're not going to be in the car taking them to lessons. They're not going to be making sure that they are involved in the theater. And the theater is so much more than, than Broadway or this, this Broadway box that, that, that I've spent a, you know, a good portion of my life in. It is the little theaters in each of these small towns. It is these regional theaters and not-for-profit theaters and the performing arts centers that we go to when we are, we are near a hub. I grew up in North Carolina right outside of Charlotte. So we went to Charlotte to see everything that came through there. Without that and that connection, we, we lose a generation of, mm. of possibility in this mm. theater. So we have to make sure that we are connecting with them early enough and making sure that when they walk into the theaters, they see people who look like them because that triggers something that says, oh, I can mm. do that. But if the people mm. in the front of the house are all white and homogenous, if the people who are handing you your playbill, if the people who are backstage in all these areas, you never see anyone that looks like you, you don't realize that it's even a possibility. So we have to make sure that yes, on stage that that we see black and brown bodies as well as white bodies, but in all these other areas as well. One of the things that we we say all the time is like, I wanna make sure there are people who look like me who are signing the checks, not just cashing the checks. You need to be in positions of power so that we are offering generational opportunity for, for people of color as, as we move the needle forward towards the true equity that so many of us say we want to see. And I say that because as, as uh, Camila knows, it's like, I mean, it's, it's this thing, especially in New York City, it's like, are we, going, are we going to build a bigger table so more people can sit at the table? That means more representation or are those who are sitting at the table now going to push themselves away and offer up that chair for someone else? And when you look at, at the theater owners and those who are in control of the not-for-profit theaters and all these organizations, in New York and on the West End as well, how are we changing that? And again, that mm. goes back to who who are the people on those boards? Yeah, who are the people who are making decisions for those theaters? That's Why do that. those those family foundations go to those large theaters and not look at the others who are on their boards, who are running, who are running those theaters? Because those foundations are making the choices as to who's getting the money, and it just continues to trickle down and down and down. But we so we have to make sure that we are in every area of the entertainment business so that so that in the generation we aren't we aren't having the same conversation yeah that's a it's a really fascinating point that you're bringing up right about who is at the table and how the table perhaps is is actually composed more generally. And I'm curious to you if you have any perspectives on which black voices are missing from the commercial theater, right? And and there is a, a really big divide sometimes. 95% of them. That I mean that's that's the right. unfortunate thing. I mean I, I think wow. we all know it's like they're 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 we we only we only hear of a few people who get the opportunity. 
but for every Pulitzer Prize winning Michael R. Jackson, there there's 16 others who haven't. Very fortunate that you know I, I've worked a great deal on stages in Broadway, but for every one of me, again, there are ten men of color who have not had the experience. So how how do we how do we how do we make room for all of us? And and again, it is the question of how large does the table need to be so that we can actually see the genius and the artistry that we that we need for in order for our business to continue into another generation. Mm -hmm. It's 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 not enough that we have one. Lynn manuel Miranda. It's great that we have him, but we want to make sure that there is room at the table and room uh, with shows being produced and readings being had and theaters being being started that all that all of those young people, all of those all of those creative possibilities, we're allowing for them. Because if you think that there's just that, if if we if we allow ourselves to think, oh, there's only one person who's able to do this, imagine what would have happened if if we had not given that one person the opportunity. And there's so many other stories that we want to have told, so many other stories that are being written that we may never hear if we continue down the road on the path that we're on right now of, oh no, this we can, we can only have one, or they can only work at this theater, or we can only support this theater that's only doing this. We really have to, we have to widen the scope of, of our net sort of across across all of theater so that we are we are making sure there are opportunities and uh, opportunities for women and 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 those who who are transgender as well as those who are black and brown so that all of these stories will be a part of this next generation. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And, and I think this is really interesting, right? I spent 10 years working at a foundation and I would say the influence of foundation in this space is really outsized and, and problematic in a lot of ways given how not diverse, even diverse foundations are, right? So when I think about some some of the most successful theater cre creators that I experienced growing up in the South, David E. Talbert and Tyler Perry, who have had essentially scant institutional interest, right? Yeah. Both they and their audiences. Do we have any sense of the specific steps that we may be able to take to capture the actual breadth of Black theater praxis in the United States? And this is for, for any of you, any perspectives on where we can really start to push at the margins? Well, I think if we think about history and what history has really taught us, um, I think about the Black Arts Movement and how the NEA and WPA funding really catapulted um, to a point where we had up to 650 Black theaters across this country. The proliferation of work and culture that came out of that time period is mind boggling um, and was really a cultural definer um, when we think about our American theater history. Um, you know, um, do you know, rest in peace, Douglas Turner Ward, right? The Negro Ensemble Company was born out of that time period and all of the wealth of artists um, from actors to playwrights that came through the Negro, Negro Ensemble and consider that space home. So when I think about that model and I think about the period that we're in now, um, you know, and, and, and I do want to amplify some visionary, you know, foundation thinkers like Ford with Darren Walker, um, Elizabeth Alexander at Mellon um, with the creation of the Black Seed Fund. Um, which is just to do just that. The Black Seed Fund is to stimulate Black theater collectives and um, smaller organizations, five million and below, um, with direct funding um, around their work to stimulate during this time period and 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 talk about this time period. You know, let alone the the world we're living in, as well as the pandemic. So you know, the, these foundations got together in order to fund this really forward thinking initiative to balance the playing field field and the inequity that exists within the funding community um, for Black theater. So uh, there has to be more of intentional thinking and funding in that way. Um, has to be more intentional thinking and board development. And then also when we talk about pipeline and Michelle, I think you, you know, thank you for bringing this up as well. Um, I'm also interested in, in particularly at PWI institutions and pipeline of leadership, where the support structures around those leaders when, when leaders of color 
do arrive into those positions, um, not only in sort of a mentorship pipeline potential, um, but you know, when I get in the position, how am I supported? Um, uh, and, and because in many times it can be a very alienated for leaders um, um, pathway. So how do we make sure that we're setting leaders up for success? I mean, this is a conversation that happens in the corporate sector a great deal. Um, and, but, but I think it's important that we're also having in the nonprofit sector that it's not just enough to name a new associate artistic director or to name a new artistic director or to name, if the, the, the systems and of support are not there to set them up for success. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really phenomenal observation, right? And you, and you think about Hamilton as being a, this product of forward support of the public or sweat as a product of melon support of the public, right? And thinking really broadly, where else do we need to buttress to have as robust support for these works as possible. I think a lot about audience development, right? And audience preparation. And do any of you have any perspective on, in terms of where we need to support the development there? Yeah, for, for me, I think it's a huge part of it is making sure that as, as people who are not considered part of the majority, that we let our funds speak for us and speak loudly. If there is a theater that is not, that is not show that is showing you who they are as opposed to showing you what they've said they want to be that we want to make sure that our stages that our, our buildings look like the world around us but you walk into them and they are not they are not they are not open to to you as a person there's nothing that's on the stage that speaks to you stop spending your money there i've, I've said this year i mean there there are a couple of shows mm -hmm. that are supposed to open on broadway when broadway reopens that have almost completely have completely white creative teams and almost the entire onstage cast is white. So guess what I'm not going to do? You're not going to get my $199. That is the way that I can speak to people who aren't listening. So we have to make sure that we we are we are part of of the fix. We are part yeah. of saying that I am going this I will support this show, this theater because they are doing the work that they said they're going to do. That their mission statement says something and they are standing behind that. So that if I know that that Camila is doing that, then I'm going to the Apollo. If I'm in London and I know that Michelle's theater is doing that, I am going to the Old Globe to see whatever's there. And and the other part of that is you can't you can't pander producers, theater owners. Don't pander to your audiences. Don't only call me or send me emails when you're doing a raisin in the sun because I actually may want to see Twelfth Night as well. Allow me to make that decision and and be a part of of be a, be a theater goer like anyone else would be. I think that's exactly the kind of thing that, well, that I wanna pick up on, but also just to pick up on something you said, Camilla, about where is the support when you are in there? I think there are, you know, the, uh, you know as someone that, you know, has, we, we talk about data, we talk about targets, we set very clear targets for our onstage demographics and that's easy to hit. But as you say, that is window dressing. You can change the face, but how are you changing the nature? And even if you still have, as we do, a woman of color that is the chair of our board or a woman of color who's on our executive team or a majoritively female led organization, that still doesn't mean you have overcome the internalized misogyny, the internalized inferiority or combating the inter internalized superiority. I think there's still an illiteracy around this that we have to not take just take our staff on and take our freelancers on and our artists on, but exactly what you're talking to, Tia, about taking our audience on that journey with us as well. And I know something right. with the globe and, and because of the canon that we have to, that we I, I'm proud to, to be part of, but that does still come with a very white centric, Anglo American centric prism and point of view. So sometimes the work can't just speak for itself. So what happens in the globe is you can have incredibly diverse creative teams and so much rigor around those conversations about decolonizing the text, triggering words, all those things that happen to decolonize those texts within the rehearsal room. But if the plays are still viewed through the prism of white centric um, uh, mm. perspectives, you're not changing, the audience still aren't with you on what that journey is. So actually, how do you, sometimes the work can speak for itself, but also how are you building frameworks and scaffolding, especially in a digital world, what else are you giving alongside the work, which is a care package, an education package, a learning package, resources, podcasts, digital behind closed doors, footage of rehearsal conversations that, um, that open up the conversations for everybody. Um, and also just, and just to pick up on something you said to you as well about 
earlier about, yes, by the time you get into the theatre to watch the work, you've already gone through layers of welcoming or not welcoming. Yeah. And I think something we talk about at the Globe and something Professor Farrakhan Cooper, who's so versed in this, who's just talking about what, how do you create a belongingness index? That it may be that you come, it may be that you are, you are working in the organisation, but do you feel as though you belong? And how do you start to not just do that with your, um, with your staff, but also with your audience? You can ask people, did they like the production? But I think still, where taste and quality is still also seen, like as a woman that plays male roles, or you, and you will know, still you're seen on stage as a risk. Something about you is perceived as lesser. So how are you getting feedback back that is not just about your taste or your opinion about the production, but also did you feel as though you were welcome in this space, in this theater? Did you feel as though you belong here? Um, as well as does the work speak to you? So I think there's, yeah, just, just to pick up on mm -hmm. a couple of things that you both said. Totally. And Michelle, I think that's a, a really, really strong point because this really is a conversation that has to start with representation, but move far beyond that, right? To how people are actually experiencing the thing once they are there. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit once again and then talk about incentives for change, right? So I think the, the business imperative around expanding representation is pretty obvious, not only for theater, but also for opera, classical music, concert, dance, and even museums. We are all sort of dealing with a, a shift in demographics that has made our business models make much less sense with each passing day. It's clear that we need to expand participation across the board. Getting the buy-in has been challenging, but it really is the easy part. Operationalizing these ideals is what is complicated. So for mm. everyone on the panel, do you think quotas and or commercial incentives would be beneficial to the equity process? And also is the nonprofit model like we see here in New York with the Roundabout Theater, a way to go that may allow some of the commercial challenges to be skirted around? Is, is that a useful approach? Well, to jump in the question of quotas, um, I, I do think benchmarks are useful. useful. Um, I think incentives are necessary. I think incentives, whether they are government incentives, whether they are corporate incentives, state a culture's values. Um, if this is something we value, we have to state it boldly and not just allow chance to move by. Um, I, I think it's I think it's actually wrong, you know, you, I, 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 and, and that's what I believe at the core, but it doesn't just stop there. Um, because like we're talking about, you know, it's not just about the incentives and getting the bodies in the buildings, but also making sure that we are questioning and re-questioning and dismantling the systems in which support, um, um, because as we know, those systems can be flawed and are flawed. Um, this is a long journey that we're talking about here. This is not a quick fix. Um, so as we are in this you know, opportunity for evolution, we have to be in it for a long haul. Yeah, so, sorry T, you were gonna. Uh, go, ahead, go ahead, Michelle, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. I will wait my turn. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to echo that and, and, and I think whether you use quotas or targets, I think you need something by which to measure yourself by and to be held accountable to. And I think the minute you set targets and there's something useful, also useful about, as you said, Camilla, about not achieving them and then going why, because that by not hitting your targets will also reveal so much about you. Like I say, I think most of us can hit targets about onstage representation. That's not a problem. When I think about the globe and writers, it's really hard for us to hit those, whether it's uh, gender targets, uh, ethnically diverse targets, and that's really revealing about why not. Well, you know, it's kind of obvious why not at the Globe because it's predominantly the resident writer is a white man, and most of the shows we have put on have been created and written by white men. So there's nothing. Go back to T's point. There's nothing that says to our amazing uh, uh, ethnically diverse writers in the UK that this is a space that wants to house me. So then it goes back to pipeline development. Where are we putting in funding to say? not just come and write a play for us, but also be in dialogue with us about what is the kind of space? How do we decolonize the space? Why is this a space that historically you have not felt like you wanted to contribute to or be in dialogue with? But we wouldn't have known that without targets. 
we wouldn't have known that without collecting data to just reveal where those gaps are um, and then to be held accountable. And as you say, where do you start to then publish that data so that every organization is publicly declaring where it wants to, where it's aspiring to be and where it's falling short. And then the next step is where our funders also investing in achieving those targets and achieving those quotas and being and not giving money unless you are seen to be working your way towards achieving them. Absolutely. And to even follow up on that, it's interesting you talk about the writers. I mean, Todd London produced um, a, 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 it, a, was a report on playwrights, um, but there was one particular section around just not only the playwriting field here in the United States, but the fact that so many of the playwrights, majority of the playwrights that get produced on American stages um, come from a very small pool of playwriting programs and elite playwriting programs, right? So we're talking about the Yales, the Juilliards, right, et cetera, the NYUs, et cetera, which we know are, are, are not diverse. They are very expensive programs. Um, and so therefore there is a system of even the layers of gatekeepers to even enter into the world, which I think to all of our used to we're talking about, right? Um, because if I can't afford to number one, get into that program, number two, when I'm in that program, support myself, or number three, support myself when I come out of that program and the average annual salary for a, an average playwright is $30,000 in New York City where the median income is 75. So I'm living below the poverty line with over $200,000 in excess loans that I owe to this program. So the math doesn't work out. So if I'm not coming from a privileged background, a financially privileged background, can I even afford to get into this career? So when, I, when we think about funding sources, at what levels are we also funding? How are we funding those writers who are, are not going into the, the top three playwriting programs um, to create their work and then to sustain themselves in order to build a career as a playwright? I mean, these are things when we talk about dismantling systems, I mean, I think it's this the kind of out of box thinking that we need to push our field, our funding field, the funding structures that be. Um, in addition to our institutions in regards to where we're looking for writers and work. Yeah, I mean, especially, I mean, the, the idea of where, where, where are we looking for the creatives that we want to, that we want to nurture over this next generation? Because as you said, I mean, again, we look, we look at these sort of these powerhouses, but, but there are stories of once again, that are coming out of these HBCUs all across this yeah. country. There are, there are stories that are coming from, you know, reservations across this country. It's like, it is, it is, it is about us being able to, to harness the power of those writers and make sure that we are allowing for those stories to be heard on some level. It's a question of like, again, the, the model for, for theater is, 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 is this model something that we need to really take a closer look at and, and not just keep trying to do a, a bandaid fix over Broadway, but theater across this globe, especially, especially in London, especially in, in the U S it's like, what are, what are we saying to, what are we saying to those around us that those who, who need these stories to nurture them, whether they're writing them or hearing them. What are they saying? What are we saying to those who 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 see the costumes in their heads or who know who they know what the lighting needs to be or what the sound needs to be as soon as they hear the words? What are we saying to them if 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 we're saying that if you go to a Yale or a Juilliard or NYU, you have a fighting chance, but if you go anywhere else, you 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 can you can hang it up, hang up your robe because it's it's unlikely that you're going to get that opportunity. And with that, it's like it continues to be this this sort of pulling pulling away the thread on on the hem of the garment and seeing seeing what the next thing is because once we look there then we start looking at at, at the quotas and the mantras that certain theaters are and statements that theaters are putting out and we we have questions on then the funding then we have questions on who's who's actually taking who's actually tallying these numbers as to what has happened and are any of those EDI leaders having conversations with each other. It's a question that it's always in my head. It's like, mm. is the EDI person at this union speaking to the EDI, EDI person at this union to the EDI person at this this foundation? And are they are they all putting the stockpiling this information, putting it together to see what the truth really is? Because Actors Equity, of which I'm a member, will can say one thing with their numbers, but it may be completely different from SDC and completely yeah. different from any of uh, you know the locals for IATSE. So how how do we get that information so that so that we as a whole can sit down and say, okay, these these this is truly where we are. 
Sure. And this is and true. How do you, and how do you have independent oversight? Like for here, it's, it's a lot of those unionized bodies that are beholden to their members. How do you have independent oversight of how, who is collecting this data mm. on behalf of who? And also something about where are you positioned in your local community? Like I think it's like, what are you saying? But also who are you serving? And these huge, as, as one of those, uh, the, the, an organization that prides itself on saying we are local, national, international, but now we really are in a, in a pocket of time of going, are you really local? Because right now, Domestic travel is going to be down in the UK. International travel is certainly not going to come back. So where are you positioned in your local community and in partnership with people that will already be doing some of this work? There are already grassroots organisations within Southwark, within, uh, certainly within London, that are working with uh, refugees, migrants, writers, like um, kids that are uh, in, at risk of reoffending. There are so many things that you could be in partnership with and in conversation with and sort of relieve these, these bodies that, are, like, that we keep looking to, that actually there are other more grassroots conversations that I think this, certainly COVID is gonna force, certainly in the UK is gonna force us to have. I, I think this is a, a really important point about the grassroots being missing from a lot of these conversations, right? And one of the things that I worry about, especially being in an EDI role in an opera company now, after having spent a long time in an EDI role at a foundation, is that there are a lot of limitations that come from our dependence as a field on philanthropic and corporate support, right? And I'm curious, um, to, especially to you, Michelle, where do you see maybe the advantages of the UK model whereby there is some governmental support in the underwriting of the operations and, and perhaps even certain amounts of guidance in terms of being able to collect data and understand what your targets are? Yeah, I think, I mean, where the globe currently sits is in this really kind of a kind of hybrid model, having been uh, independent from nearly 23 years. Um, we are now completely, uh, you know, we would be in such serious trouble without support from our government to keep us afloat, whether it's with grants or with loans. I think, again, what this time has revealed to the government is how if you can't measure something, you have to then by fault, default sort of value it at zero. <laughs> So where does arts, culture, artists, those makers, how do you value those people? And therefore, how much are you able to contribute to exactly as you said, Camilla, where, where, where we have, because um, it, it's not state funded. So all our freelancers are now just decimated. Whereas, or, you know, we've got this amazing furlough scheme. So if you are in permanent employment, you still get some income. If you are a freelancer, you now have nothing. And yet our freelance, make up 50% of our workforce. So I think there are lots of things that this time has revealed to government. And one of the big things that with the, the support of government, the right kind of data collection, ethical frameworks around how you collect data, what data you are collecting, but also then you can make policies and it's policies that underpin all of these unconscious structures that we're still beholden to that we don't fully understand. So I think where, where true change can come is through policy. So it's not reliant on an individual comes in with a particular vision to represent and then when that person goes another one comes in with an entirely different perspective on how they want to run their theatre or produce their theatre. There are policies underpinning the sector, not just individual organisations expected to do this work because as we know, to do this work requires funding. To do this work also requires some kind of HR support, which only most of the bigger organizations have. Only most of the bigger organizations can afford the EDI or the anti-racist training. So where is a centralized body of which government could be part of that conversation that is providing some of this support where we can share learnings and and also crucially not politicize it because this is beyond politics. And I think that's the difficulty with our government that everything is politicized right now. And actually there are some conversations, whether it's climate justice, social justice that have nothing to do, which, which it's not a political tool to try and get the next voters. This is beyond politics. So I think there is something about shared learning regardless of whether you receive arts council funding or not that, um, yeah, that's that's sort of where I sit with that, that how government can help help then centralize information and help form policies, uh, ethical frameworks around procurement, recruitment, or what, whatever it is, you name it, but we need ethical frameworks and we need policies. 
Thank you for that. I, I think there are numerous lessons for us to learn as our, our government is at least equally polarized around many of the same issues. Um, and that takes me to COVID, which I feel like um, has sort of been the elephant in the room through a lot of these conversations. I think we're, we're learning a lot in this period about audience engagement, workplace equity, technological innovation, and the legal complexities of presenting live theater online. Is this experience teaching us anything about how we can democratize whose work is being presented? And this is to any of you. Yeah. I, 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 I always say that art making is, a, is, is probably the most democratizing force and place. When you're in the art making process, um, there's a jazz musician, Stefan Harris, who says that um, the bandstand is the most democratizing, you know, place because it's all about you have to listen and receive. If you pass me a note, I got to hear it and I got to pass it right back. There is no selfishness or hoarding on the bandstand. So when successful, I should say successful collaboration in art making is democratizing. And quite frankly, so has this pandemic. Uh, this pandemic has been quite a democratizing um, space for all of us because right now, from large to small, arts organizations are feeling the grave impact um, around the pandemic and, and, and have had to make major um, you know, decisions in order for their own survival. Um, so yes, innovation, innovation around digital uh, it, it, that we're seeing around digital producing, um, innovation around even how we're thinking about staffing. We've had to repurpose our staff um, in order to make sure that you know uh, we can keep staff on you know on payroll. Um, um, so there's been a lot of innovations in just thinking about structures um, and questioning structures in a way that. I, without this pandemic, I don't think we would. We would have gone on as planned on as usual. I guess the big question for me um, is in regards to how do we see our way out of this? And not just as arts institutions, but as cultural arts leaders, along with our civic partners. Um, I think arts is a, you know, the beauty of the arts is that it, it, it has the possibility to, to vision possibility for future way forward. Um, it, it creates empathy, it keeps people close, it reminds us of our humanity. Um, and if there's any point in time that we need to be reminded of all those things, it is now. Um, so I think it's truly important now that we are working hand in hand in tandem with our civic leaders as arts and cultural leaders of how do we feel again, of how do we choreograph a way back into re-entry into society. Um, and that can't just be done with, um, you know, sort of our civic leaders top down. Um, I know that we'll have a vaccine plan. That's great that they're rolling out 25% occupancy plan. Um, but there's another layered plan that I don't think we have quite fully addressed yet. Um, and, and that requires having artists and cultural leaders sitting at the table along with civic leaders, truly mapping out what did this plan forward to feel again? What does this plan forward for us to be in the same space and, and, and be human again um, really require? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you there. I mean, it's, it, is, it is a thing that I, I've said to myself throughout this entire pandemic is like, this pause allowed us to see who we are and where we are. Uh, and again, if, if, if it had not been for that, we would have, we would have gone through this, mm -hmm. these past, this past year of, of seeing things, but going, okay, but I'm, I'm busy. I've got to go to work or I'm busy. I've got to go to this meeting or I'm busy. I got to do that. But we had to pause. We had to sit in these feelings and what we were seeing over this past year. And for me, it's, it's, it's saying to myself, who do I want to be on the other side of this? Who just who do we want to be as as artists on the other side of this? How do we want to make art? I mean, uh, one of my friends, he's um, PhD and and sort of vocal performance, and and you may know him, Lee. He he said to me one day, and we were on we were on on a Zoom, which we all spend so much time on. He said, "Our medicine is in our stories," and it it hit me so hard because it is that question of on the other side of this, along with those civic leaders, these arts and culture leaders. How are we going to get ourselves and our communities and our humanity back? Because we're going to be so broken and so, mm. so numb 
when we get back to the place where we can even at 25% get ourselves back into theaters, when we can hear music on mass again, when we can see the smile of someone on a stage again, it's, it's, it's going to be cathartic. Yes. But, but the emotional toll that this past year has taken on all of us, how, how do we approach that? How do we begin to, to, to soothe what is going to be when mm. we are able to make the art again? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I have nothing. Uh, both of you have just articulated it so so amazingly, and I think uh, the only thing I, I would say is about the, the mental health crisis that we are um, yes. we are in, and that the shadow of that is going to last far longer than the impacts right. of COVID. And like and as as we've done, understandably, where we go to is the measurable because we need the measurable, so that, as we've all articulated, we need how much money, how many people, what are the facts, because that's something to hold on to that we can, in the face of so much opinion, it's irrefutable. But there is something around the work that is immeasurable and unquantifiable, and how, when we have not been able to be in touch, how do we stay in touch, how do we, and this is where I think theatre, the power of theatre, or power of theatres as places of congregation, um, really need to step up to the plate and actually reclaim their place and I, I don't know what it's like in the states but you know theatre is, is um, still perceived as, a, as a, an elite art form but it is the home of as we there's that democratization but it's also the home of congregation how will we congregate again um, and how will the work speak to that I, 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 I do think we're heading to something really authentic I think we sort of um, uh, we're on Zoom calls now and I have no idea how you're feeling. We're so used to like being in contact and reading the 90% of, st of stuff that isn't what's said. Mm. I think suddenly there will be sensory overload when we're back around human bodies mm. again and, and being around senses again. And I think mm. that as you say to just being in the presence of a play or a present of music or the expression of the human soul is gonna be so profound. And again, it comes back to care. What care package are we putting around our artists and also around our audience that we should, I think there's something about an honest dialogue that's gonna emerge from this that I think is really gonna be really profound and necessary. Thank you for that. Those were all really, really powerful responses. I wanted to take um, some time, we have about 10 minutes or so left, and take a few questions from the audience. Um, I'll start with this first one from Margot. African Americans represent 13.7% of the US population according to the latest figures. Are African Americans represented in at least that percentage in current theater, front or backstage? I don't think so. What do you think? I mean, I, I would agree. I mean, looking looking at the data that uh, that uh, Warren Adams, my co-founder, and I uh, went through when we were starting Black Theater Coalition, realized that you know, since you know, in the in the past hundred fifty plus years, uh, the shows on Broadway, you know, two maybe three Black lead producers of a show, seventeen Black choreographers. 10 black directors of a musical, I think 11 black directors of play of, of a play, all of those numbers are less than less than 1% of, of those who have been working over three, 3000 plus musicals, 6800 plus plays. So no, we're, we're not we're not anywhere close. I mean, yes, if you start looking at the number of on stage, it may be a little higher, but we are, we are nowhere near the numbers we should be. And, and again, for me, it's like, if if we want to be about putting art on stage and and telling the best stories we have to look outside of where we have been looking we again it's back to you know we have to expand that table we have to expand that table so so more playwrights can sit at that table so more sound designers are at that table more costume designers are at the table more directors more artistic directors more producers are at the table because if if we allow for that then we allow for opportunity from others. It's, it is that it is that that trickle down. If there are black producers leading something, then you better believe there are going to be a lot more black people and brown people working on those on those shows. As Camila said, when she, as she was producing, it was like you want to make sure that there are then there are people who are in all of those positions who who look like the world. Uh, it's something that um, Ava DuVernay is definitely doing with with. Uh, her database for Hollywood to really make and on on, on her, her productions, making sure that there are a number 
the, the percentages of black and brown bodies are extremely high on, on those productions, but we have to do that. We have to, we have to be, we have to take control. Cause as you said, Lee, at the very beginning, this system is not broken. The system is working exactly the way it was supposed to work for white men. So how do, how do, how do we rig the system in the other direction until the pendulum swings back to center? And we have to push and push and push. And maybe that is with, with mandates. Maybe that is with, with checking, always checking these percentages, you know, month after month to see if we are actually moving the needle so that we know in, in five years or in a decade, the work that has been done or how much more work needs to be done. So that was, and that was, those are staggering figures and even in commercial theater across arts and performing arts centers across the country. We, 2016, the number was 4%. Um, African American. Um, in regards to leaderships of major theaters and performing arts center, we represent 1.5%. So yeah. staggering yeah. based yeah. on population. Yeah. And even and so also based on cultural impact to American culture. That's the other point, mm -hmm. right? Um, we, um, African American culture is a cultural driver in this nation and global culture, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but but who is actually sitting in the driver's seat and having in, in, in positions of power of, of, of controlling and also shaping the cultural images that we see. And even sitting with these numbers every day on the classical music side, they're, they're still shocking to hear, you know. Um, and I would like to be able to end this really, really fantastic panel on a, a really positive note. And I would love it if each of you may be able to say just a word or two about either a company or an individual or maybe a part of the field that right now is doing really exciting work that gives you hope regards to equity and inclusion in the theater going forward. Well, I, I, I will begin. Uh, uh... Uh, I have to say, well, one, the organization uh, that I co-founded this summer, uh, Black Theater Coalition, our mission statement is to remove the illusion of inclusion in the American theater by helping build a sustainable roadmap towards uh, towards um, employment for Black professionals. Uh, we are also we are we are also standing ar arm in arm linked with our sister organizations, Broadway Advocacy Coalition, Broadway for Racial Justice, Black Theater United, uh, all of these organizations, because we realize that none of us can do it alone so that we, we want to make sure that we are really moving the needle together towards equity for everyone. So I'm, I'm really I'm really happy that so many organizations and so many so many people had the Oprah aha moment during this pause to say, we have to be a part, we have to be a part of this fix. Uh, and it's not only the, you know, the, those black professionals that are working, but also as we call them, our, our accomplices, those white industry leaders who have stepped up and said, we know that we know that there has been a problem. We know that we've been a part of the problem. What can we do to help fix that? So we're, we're, it's, it's a journey that we're on and it's a journey, as Camila said, this is not a, this is not a right now, this is a journey that's going to continue and the work will continue over these next years. But I have to say that I, I am absolutely excited about this moment that we are in right now. The thing we have to also just be, we have to realize is that those who are in power, who were in power when, when theater shut down are still in power. So how do we begin to fix that over these next months so that, so that the words that are being said are being followed by the actions. But I am I am definitely excited about where we are. Yeah, I would say the same. I think probably similar to most organizations in the States. Uh, every organization in the UK has released its data, put out its statement of intent. Then how do you convert that intent into action? And one organization that is doing that is Inc. Arts, which is, again, an independent body that is going out sector wide reaching out to organizations saying, please be in dialogue with us. I mean, we're still yet to have to formalize what that is, but how do we have sector-wide movements rather than individual theaters, you know, some at different levels on the spectrum of, of, of these conversations. Um, I would also say that this, you know, where America is leading the conversation in this is, um, is not least with Professor Farrah Karen Cooper, who's our kind of, we have a, at the Globe, we have an in-house research. So where we have the, the something really which i think again in the states and this may be my mis, uh, misconception but where academic organizations and cultural organizations are in dialogue with each other there's something that, that that's uh really important but also she is an american so she knows about she's literate in this conversation 
Um, but that means labour falls really hard on individuals. So just to call out to her and also to Nicole Brewer, who's someone who's amazing, um, who came over and did, is doing so much work with organisations in the UK around specifically anti-racist theatre. Um, and conscientious training when people don't want to say anti-racism because they're still frightened by that word, but how she gets you to claim anti-racism as something that is important to say and important to own and important to work towards. Um, these are individuals that are, are, are the labour is falling to them at the moment. And so it's, that's why it's amazing that people like Inc. Arts are now also coming in as organisations, meeting organisations to alleviate the burden on people. But yeah, they're amazing individuals. Great. Um, and, you know, I, I would, um, again, I think I talked about it earlier, highlight the work of Black Seed. Um, I think it is a, di a disruption to the funding structure. Um, and one thing we do know about funding and philanthropy is that they move towards trends. Um, so I hope that this is a trend that will continue and continue to take on. I also hope that, you know, hopefully this will inspire, given the in in pandemic, do you know that we need uh, we need another WPA coming out of this pandemic and true infusion in the arts with a very specific focus around this issue um, coming from national governmental funds. Um, like I like I stated earlier, it made a huge difference in sort of the proliferation of the Black Arts Movement back in the 60s. And it's important that we, we start to think about that again. Um, and also just to highlight some of the grassroots movements that, that have been happening. Um, you know, in, it, you mentioned Array, what's happening, you know, with uh, Ava DuVernay. Netflix has a similar internal database around crews and crews of colors um, that that literally was started by one employee. This was not a, a, a government, a corporate mandate, but by one employee. Um, and that has happened in the theater community, right? There were individuals who started certain databases so that when people say, I don't know any black lighting designers or writing lighting designers of color, well, here's a database that includes names across the country that you can get to know. Um, and so I, I just like to highlight those kinds of efforts um, that are coming from our field, um, not even necessarily institution, but individuals, and that's important. T, Camila, and Michelle, thank you again for your thoughts, as well as for your critical work in this space. And thank you to all of you for tuning in this afternoon.